Hello, this is Michael Martin, president of ECFA. It's my privilege to welcome you to today's ECFA webinar on what the presidential transition means for religious ministries. This is obviously such a critical and timely topic as we track the latest developments from our nation's capital impacting churches and ministries. And because of that, we are pleased to have with us today a leading expert to walk us through these issues. Our special guest presenter is attorney Amy Vitale, Government Affairs Counsel for Beckett, a premier nonprofit law firm dedicated to defending religious liberty for all in principle and in practice. Amy joined Beckett as a fellow in 2016. She previously served as legislative counsel to several members of Congress, supporting their work to protect religious freedom for people of all faiths through efforts like drafting legislation and coordinating multiple member amicus briefs to the Supreme Court. Before moving to Washington, D.C., she practiced law in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm looking forward to hearing Amy's insights on the policy priorities of the new administration, and what the impacts might be on religious organizations. But first, what's a good legal webinar without a legal disclaimer? I should note that while Amy and I are both attorneys, the materials on today's webinar are provided for general information purposes only and are not a substitute for legal advice particular to your situation. No recipients of this information should act or refrain from acting solely on the basis of this webinar without seeking professional legal counsel. I'll also mention here that ECFA is nonpartisan and the focus of our presentation today is not political. We simply want to convey information regarding the most important policy developments on the horizon that could impact religious organizations. Before we continue much further, let me open our time in a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather today through technology. Uh, we thank you for uh, this webinar and also for, for Amy and her expertise and just the information that she will be able to share that will help provide insights to our ministries. I pray for her presentation today. I thank you for each one joining us. And on a topic like today's presentation, we also take this opportunity, Lord, just to pray for all who are in governing authority, Lord. We uh, are grateful for their leadership and we lift them up today uh, as we have this conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. And without further ado, I'll now turn today's presentation over to our special guest presenter, Amy Vitale. Amy, take it away. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm so grateful for you and ECFA and the great work that you do. Uh, your capacity for leadership was evident from a very early time in your career. We've known each other a long time, yeah. and it's it's great to yeah. be with you today. Uh, so just a, a, a few points by way of introduction. I will reiterate what Michael said about the legal disclaimer. Uh, my goal today and what I have uh, curated for you is to talk about practical, very tactile facts on the ground, but it's not meant to be legal advice. And it's also not meant to be advice on lobbying, not lobbying, what qualifies as that, how to engage as a 501c3. Those are all questions that are, are separate from today's presentation. By way of introduction, as Michael said, I work for the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. We've been defending religious freedom for people of all faiths for over 25 years. We've defended more than 40 different religions from Buddhists to Christians, Jews and Muslims, Hindus, across the board. We like to say we've defended from A to Z, from Anglicans to Zoroastrians. And we believe very passionately that religious freedom is fundamental to human dignity and that the government does not have a place in telling us how we exercise our faith. Um, and so everything we do is about religious liberty litigation. We are also a nonpartisan organization. We don't take political positions. Um, we, we focus purely on defending religious liberty for people of all faiths. So that will be the context of my remarks today. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, and as a lifelong evangelical, even though today is not a sermon, I do know the importance of a good sermon outline. So we will start with that. We're going to cover four things today, and it's going to be a lot of ground, but I promise you, stick with me. We'll get through it. So first, we're going to look at key features of the current political landscape. What is what is the agency landscape look like right now? Obviously, the White House 
I could spend days getting into the nuances of everything that is involved here, uh, but we're going to do a, a very concise and functional overview in the time that we have together. I majored in political science. I went to law school, I took administrative law, and while I had a strong grasp of the theory, for how, I really did not gain most of this practical knowledge until I started working in the House of Representatives. It was trial by fire, and so I hope today we can boil some of that down to be functional for you as well. Second, we're going to review some of the most important actions bearing on religious liberty concerns that were taken in the Trump administration. Third, we're going to look at what actions the Biden administration has taken, what actions they have signaled they're going to take, and what actions they have been asked to take. So those are three distinct categories. We'll get into that. And finally, and probably most importantly for you, we're going to discuss how this information practically applies to you and to your ministries. So let's start off with Congress. Uh, we're in a really interesting, somewhat historic moment where there's a 50-50 split in the Senate. The last time that happened was in 2001. It only lasted for a few months until Senator Jeffords changed his party affiliation from Republican to independent and started caucusing with the Democrats and that broke the 50-50 split. Um, and so this is important for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's an even division down the Senate. Um, committees are split 50-50 in votes and step with their conference. The vote is 50-50. And of course, the vice president bears the tie-breaking vote in the Senate if there's a, if there's a tie um, for a vote. But it's also important because in the Senate, um, they need 60 votes to get something across known as the, the filibuster. You've probably read a debate over will the filibuster last? What's going to happen? Um, what can they do if they only have 50 votes plus the vice president break a tie? Who can they win over in, in either direction in order to get something passed? And so those are very real, tangible debates um, that matter in terms of going to get through the Senate. There are a few areas and world is sufficient to get something passed. One of those areas is the budget reconciliation, and it just considered this measure last week. Um, you'll see that happening will have to be germane to the budget. Um, it can't just be any, anything attached to that bill. There are disapproval res resolutions under the Congressional Review Act, or the same mechanism that Congress has to override an agency regulation and prohibit that agency from issuing a similar rule without their express permission in the future. And confirmations. Most confirmations happen at the 51 vote threshold, and there's a very interesting history from the last 10 years as to how that process evolved and in, in what order, but we won't get into that today. Well, Amy, yeah, maybe before you turn to the House, uh, you mentioned that filibuster rule, and I know a lot of folks are keeping kind of an eye on that. They're seeing that in the news. Can you tell us uh, what what do you see? I know we can't predict into the future, um, but uh, what do you see with respect to the future of the filibuster uh, in the Senate? Do you think that it will hold up? It's a really great question. It was certainly a point of negotiation between Senator Schumer and Senator McConnell as they were working out the organizing rules for the 117th Congress in the Senate. It was not determined, there was not a promise in that, in that uh, resolution to keep the filibuster. So it could change, but Senators Manchin and Sinema have both committed to keeping it. There's going to be a lot of pressure on the majority leader to get rid of that filibuster threshold in order to pass more substantive legislation. Um, but as long as there aren't the votes, 51 votes to change that rule, the filibuster will remain in place. So too soon to tell how the whole Congress will play out. Two years is a lifetime. In, uh, <laughs> Isn't that the <laughs> truth? <laughs> Um, so yeah, we will see. Time will tell, but right now uh, it looks like it's it's going to hold for the time being. Uh, moving on to the executive branch and the White House, I just want to walk through and flag a key offices and functions uh, that will be relevant as you maybe are watching what policy priorities are coming out of the executive branch. So the first uh, office you should be aware of is the White House Counsel's Office, which is the office full of lawyers at the White House. They're responsible for a lot of things, 
on behalf of the president. Um, but part of that of their responsibility includes advising on the legal implications of policy considerations. So what does the Constitution have to say within the context of the First Amendment about religious exercise is something that certainly comes across the desks of attorneys in that office. Another entity that you should be aware of, and frankly, I think a lot of people aren't even aware exists, is the Domestic Policy Council. This was created in 1993 by executive order of President Clinton, and they're responsible for developing and implementing the president's policy agenda. Uh, so they have staff, much like a congressional office has staff that are tasked with certain portfolios of issues. Uh, the Domestic Policy Council has staff that focus on specific issues on policy in the same way. And a third really important office, particularly when it comes to the regulatory agenda of an administration, is OIRA, or the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Would not be a government conversation if I did not throw a lot of acronyms <laughs> at you today. Uh, so I'll try to be careful to spell them all out. Uh, but OIRA is a, a part of the Office of Management and Budget with the White House, and they're responsible for regulatory control. So they review all of the proposed and final regulatory proposals that are coming up from the federal agencies. They do have the ability to make changes throughout that process. They meet with people who have an interest in the outcome of a potential rule. Um, and so that's another really important office in, in the road to a regulation being finalized and printed in the Federal Register. We'll get into that more in a little bit. Other common tools that you'll see used out of the White House, specifically by the president, that can be important indicators of policy agendas and priorities uh, would include executive orders and presidential memos. Um, executive orders, we've already seen 29 of them uh, from President Biden. I checked the, the current count this morning in the Federal Register. Um, but they are a key tool to managing the operations and policy coming out of the executive branch. So there are some ways in which the president is able to act unilaterally. He's not bound to wait for Congress. And executive orders are, are one tool in the toolbox for him to do that. And memos, they are, are of less import than the executive orders, but they do have uh, policy positions um, and important information in them um, in terms of where an administration is heading with its, with its policy priorities. Proclamations would be another example. These can also include policy statements from the president. They're often used ceremonially. So for the National Day of Prayer or to recognize National Adoption Month or insert any number of issues that the president might wanna make a statement on, they have uh, proclamation as a tool for the president to be able to do that. Signing statements, this is a statement that a president will either speak or issue alongside signing a bill um, into law. And we'll, we'll reference that a little bit later when we start talking about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And budget proposals, which is the, the president's budget recommendations to Congress. Congress is not bound by them, but it's an important opportunity for the White House to start branching out and, and, and create policy uh, priorities through what they put and prioritize in, in the president's budget. Moving on within the executive branch to the different federal agencies, and of course, most of the agency heads then make up the cabinet. And so these two entities work, they're, they're all under the executive branch and they work in tandem with one another. Um, agencies are really important because they exercise authority that is de delegated to them by Congress. This happens a lot. That's a whole different debate if you want to talk about how much that should happen, why it happens, under what circumstances. But the fact of the matter is that agencies do have authority to create regulations that have the force and effect of a law passed by Congress. They exercise this authority pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act, or the APA. And practically, they do this through what's called the notice and comment process. So they can't just create a rule and say, this is what we're sticking to. There has to be this process by which they propose something and the general public has the opportunity to comment on the rule, how it would impact them, what they like, what they would change. Um, and so it's a very public process. It's a matter of, um, and you can get to it. It through uh, federal.gov and regulations.gov are the two important places um, in which these proposed rules are published. So the general process 
is that an agency will issue a proposed rule called an NPRM or a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. The public then has a set period of time to comment on that proposed rule. And this can be as formal or informal as you would want it to be. Um, individual citizens comment, organizations comment. You see a whole broad range um, in, in feedback that will come to an NPRM. An agency then has to review and respond to all of those comments and consider revisions, and then they issue the final rule. So it's probably an oversimpli oversimplified uh, summary, but that's the general process of how, uh, how an agency creates a rule. Once they're finalized, they're published in the Federal Register, and they do have the force and effect of law. If this is something you're interested in following, you can sign up for daily digests and summaries uh, from the Federal Register. Uh, for what's published by agency or by search term. I get a grouping of emails early every single morning that tells me what has been published in the Federal Register for that day. A lot to process um, if you're looking at everything. So you're gonna know what you're looking for when you're tracking rules and regulations. Another tool that is really important in the context of agencies um, and the work that they do impacting our organizations is are, are called guidance documents. And so these documents, they're not a rule. They don't go through the, the rulemaking process, uh, but they do stake out statements of an agency's position on a specific regulatory process. They're often in more lay terms and maybe a regulation might be. They're plain language explanations of an agency's interpretation of a regulation. They're not supposed to have the force and effect of law. Um, that's varied over time. Um, but they are not intended to be something, nor are they supposed to be something that can have the force and effect of law in the way that a regulation does. Yeah, that's actually a place where I was going to interject here with a little bit of a follow-up question as I was tracking with you, Amy. Um, you talked about both the agency rules and also agency guidance. So maybe tell us, uh, those who aren't in this every day, a little bit more about the difference between those two. And I imagine there's got to be some instances where uh, the lines would get a little bit blurry. <laughs> so maybe you could uh, help unpack that for us. They do. And it's, it's an important distinction. And so you don't want the lines to be blurred between the two. Because agencies are exercising delegated authority from Congress, it's important that there is the opportunity for public feedback on what they're proposing that will have the force and effect of law. Um, but at various times um, over the years, agencies have issued guidance as a way to encourage a policy outcome uh, that maybe they would like, but they have not gotten through the NPRM process. And so it's important when you're looking at documents from an agency to recognize what is binding um, as a matter of law and what is not. Um, and so guidance documents really purely are supposed to be policy statements or you know, helpful applications, um, or a lot of agencies will issue um, opinion letters on how they would apply the rules and laws in their jurisdiction to a specific set of circumstances. Um, but those tools are not meant to expand, expand into the area of regulations um, and, and basically making as a, as a backdoor to make where rules have not actually been finalized. And this was something that uh, the past DOJ, the Trump DOJ, did actually take issue with um, and uh, issued a memo called the Brand Memo. It was issued by Rachel Brand um, to say that guidance documents are guidance documents and you need to make clear on those documents that they do not have the force and effect of law. Got it. No, that's very helpful. Thanks. So moving on to functionally, we've talked about Congress. We've talked about the executive branch and the ways in which the White House and the agencies function. I also want to take a step back for a moment and talk about some really important uh, existing protections in federal law for faith-based organizations. And so we're going to dwell on this for a few minutes because it's pretty heavy content, um, but I think it's really important to have a, a good understanding of the underlying legal principles that are at issue here in balancing government interests and the interests of faith-based organizations. The first that we're gonna talk about is called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA. 
Um, you may have heard this come up in public conversations and debate over the last couple of years. It's been litigated at the Supreme Court um, in cases like Hobby Lobby and the Little Sisters of the Poor, which are both Beckett clients. Um, and, and this statute was passed in 1993 as a congressional response to a Supreme Court decision authored by Justice Scalia called Employment Division versus Smith. And this was a case where there were two Native American men who were fired for smoking peyote, which is, is a, a drug, a hallucinogen drug, um, but part of, of some Native American religions. And they were fired and then were denied employment benefits. And they sued. And the Supreme Court uh, said, basically, where there is a neutral, generally applicable law that wasn't meant to target a sincere religious practice, it can be enforced, even if it's if it's Im imposing a burden on that religious practice. And this was a result that was so untenable to so many different organizations and faiths and people of varying backgrounds that an unprecedentedly diverse coalition came together to pass RIFRA. Um, and they passed it in two Congress sessions. Um, they introduced it uh, right after the decision, and then they passed it through in the next Congress, which is, is really very fast for how Congress moves. Um, and not only did they pass it fairly quickly, it was passed nearly unanimously, which is also virtually unheard of, even in 1993. Um, a lot of time has passed, but uh, there was just such a, an agreement that the government should not be burdening religious practice, whether they do it overtly <laughs> and intentionally or whether they do it unintentionally, that that's not acceptable. Um, and when President Clinton signed this bill, we mentioned signing statements earlier, he said, and I quote, let us never believe that the freedom of religion imposes on any of us some responsibility to run from our convictions. Let us instead respect one another's faiths fight to the death to preserve the right of every American to practice whatever convictions he or she has. Hmm. And so RIFRA then became the important statute in the federal makeup uh, because across all federal law. And RIFRA does not pick winners or losers. It simply says that when an individual has been burdened in their religious practice by, by the government, they can go to a court and they can have their case heard by a judge and the judge will apply this balancing test to determine whether or not their, their religious exercise um, can be burdened by the government. So it's a balancing test that works through three questions. The first question asks whether or not the individual has a sincere faith or belief that is being substantially burdened. It's a term of art. If the answer to that question is no, the individual loses on the spot. We don't need to go any further. If the answer to that question is yes, that there has been a sincere religious belief that has been burdened. You move on to the next question in the balancing test. The second question is whether or not the government has a compelling interest or a really good reason, like public health or safety, to interfere with that religious practice. If the answer to that question is no, then the government loses. If the answer to that question is yes, then the case moves forward. So if there is a compelling interest like public health or safety. The last question in the analysis is whether or not the government is accomplishing its objective through what's called the least restrictive means, which basically means, is there another alternative that can reasonably both serve the public interest and allow this religious exercise of the individual in question to move forward? And so this balancing test is, has been a really important protection, particularly for minority phase, where the government might pass a law and you don't realize that uh, you're accidentally burdening the religious exercise of a faith that you had not maybe considered when you were passing the law. After Hobby Lobby, which was decided in 2015, opponents of that decision tried to argue, well, RIFRA's broken. This is now going to allow a flood of very distinctly Christian claims to come before the court and, uh, and allow those people to impose their beliefs on others. Um, if you were following the news at the time, I'm sure you saw an awful lot of this come up in your news feeds. But that prediction has not played out. And in an empirical study that uh, some of my colleagues at Beckett did a few years ago, we were able to show that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is still a really important piece of legislation protecting primarily religious minorities. 
So a lot of people bring a claim, uh, but the claims lose under RFRA regularly. And the judiciary has the ability to weigh in balance based on the specific facts and circumstances. So that remains a really important statute um, moving forward, particularly, as I said, for members of minority religions or religions that might not be fully understood. So RIFRA is the first. Yeah, Amy, I was going to jump into just another question here. I know we're putting you on the spot a little bit and asking some of these future-minded questions, but I know that's what a lot of folks are interested in, too. Uh, a little concerning what you said there about some of the latest trends or thinking related to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act or RIFRA. W what do you see in terms of what its future looks like? Uh, do we feel fairly comfortable with where it's at, or are there some threats that we should be concerned with? It's a great question. I think there are both... Uh, overt threats to the future of what R RIFRA looks like and also unintended ones. So a few years ago, uh, RIFRA, as I mentioned, applies across all of federal law. And in order for Congress to make it not apply, they have to specifically say RIFRA does not apply. So they have to intentionally waive the statute in order for it to not apply to an area of federal law. That has never been done mm. in the history of RIFRA. And frankly, it doesn't need to be done because RIFRA is inherently a balancing test and the government can win if they have a compelling interest to do so. So if you carve RIFRA out, you're essentially saying, we don't mind if the government has an uncompelling interest in a certain area to burden religion. We're gonna allow that over here. That's essentially what a RIFRA waiver would mean. There was a bill introduced in the 116th Congress called the Do No Harm Act that tries to gut the application of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, and the Equality Act as well, which you may have heard about, also guts the Religious Freedom Act and its application to certain federal statutes. Um, and so RIFRA's future is not certain, uh, but it's defensible in terms of how it functions, who it protects, and what it was meant to do, that that function is still very much alive and well in the context of how it's working in the courts. Good. Well, certainly, yeah, something to keep our eyes on. <laughs> it is. It is. And sometimes it can happen unintentionally. There was a bill a few years ago, an immigration bill, where it was included. And I don't think staff even realized at the time mm. that it was in there. Um, it was removed before the bill passed. But it's definitely something worth keeping a close eye on. Two other really important doctrines uh, for religious organizations in, in existing federal and constitutional law are Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. The related doctrine, although it's constitutional and not statutory, is the ministerial exception. So we'll talk briefly about both of those. Um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, of course, discrimination by an employer against an employee that falls into a certain list of specified protected categories. And one of those categories includes religion um, and, and, and a number of others. Um, it also provides an exemption for religious organizations that employ, quote, individuals of a particular religion. Um, and so under the statute, that is defined as all aspects of religious observance and practice as well as belief. So there's been some conversation um, in the academic world over the years. Does that mean that you can hire co-religionists? So Catholics can hire Catholics, but they're not required to hire Baptists, for example. Or does that mean that an organization has the right to hire based on tenants? observation and belief. Um, and it is by and large the second category um, that, that wins out in the case law. In uh, Bostock versus Clayton County, which was decided last June, the Supreme Court did expand the definition of, of sex, which is one of the protected categories, to include sexual orientation and gender identity. In that case, it's important to note it did not raise any religious freedom claims. And so the tension between the, the protected categories in Title VII um, and the religious exemption in Title VII did not come up in that case. But the Supreme Court was very specific to state, and I quote, we are deeply concerned with the preserving of the promise of free exercise of religion enshrined in our constitution. That guarantee lies at the heart of our pluralistic society. So that's a question for the Supreme Court for another day. Um, but we do know that Title VII has decades of history um, of application to how this religious hiring exemption for religious organization 
functions. It's very specifically for religious organizations, and I think that's important to highlight. A very related doctrine is the ministerial exception. This is based not in statute, but in the First Amendment itself. It was first recognized by the Supreme Court in 2011 in a Beckett case known as Hosanna Tabor. Um, and in both cases about the ministerial exception uh, that have come before the Supreme Court, both Hosanna Tabor and Our Lady of Guadalupe School, on their Beckett case from last summer, in the cases involved a teacher and whether or not the, uh, the school at issue was able to make a hiring decision um, based out of uh, that, that question of, of tenants and that the important um, fundamental principle of that ministerial exception doctrine is that the government does not get to tell a religious organization who is responsible for, for carrying out ministry within that religious organization, who is responsible for teaching and, and, and carrying that on to the next generation. Um, and in Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Supreme Court made very clear that this is not an exemption that's just limited to, quote, ordained ministers, but it can extend to other employees of a religious organization who perform religious functions. So there's a lot still to be played out on that ministerial exception front, uh, but we do have two very clear decisions from the Supreme Court, one of them unanimous and the other seven to two, um, explaining that, that the government is in a position to tell a church who they do and do not hire for carrying out their ministries. Well, Amy, I know I'm speaking for everyone who's listening on the webinar today and saying thank you for the advocacy on the part of Beckett in both of those really important cases. But on the ministerial exception, this is a common question that we get here at ECFA uh, following some of those cases. Uh, but that being, does that ministerial exception doctrine apply to all the employees of a religious organization, or now that we know it's not just per se people with the title of minister, how far does that go? Uh, is that a question uh, that you're able to answer something that you all are tracking? It is absolutely something we're tracking. Um, and what we do know for sure is that it can apply to ministers and it can apply even beyond that to employees who perform religious functions. Mm -hmm. But the exact limit of the ministerial exception has yet to to be fully played out. And we have a number of cases in the lower courts this is at issue. And I think it's important to remember too, for religious organizations in the arena of hiring, it's not one doctrine or another. It is a, a toolbox of religious protections that come to bear on how you make hiring decisions for your organizations. Yeah, good point. Uh, I think it's important to lean on as much of those as you possibly can. And a lot of it in, in the world of hiring, there's a very strong strain of common sense, right? So if you put it in terms of, of political terms, you don't see Republican offices hiring Democrats and vice versa. Um, you don't see organizations that are based around a specific and hiring someone who does not support and agree with furthering that mission. Um, and in the context of, of religious organizations, you have that First Amendment element there as well. That is really important. So you know, we've talked a lot about the function of this Congress, how it's structured, um, and some really key protections that bear on, on faith-based organizations and religious ministries. We're going to very quickly run through some of the Trump administration actions that came on religious freedom questions, and then, uh, which is our second point, and then look at the third point of what we have seen and, and can expect to see potentially from the Biden administration. So the Trump administration, and I, I don't have time to go into detail on um, on everything, and the list on the slide is, is really only of it, of what they did in the religious liberty space as well. Um, but of course, he issued an executive order, President Trump, on, um, on May 4th, which was the National Day of Prayer in 2017, Executive Order 13798, where he directed all of the agencies to take a very close look at how they were understanding intersections of religious liberty concerns with uh, the rules and regulations and guidance that were under their purview. 
And then pretty soon on the heels of that executive order, the Department of Justice issued a very lengthy explanation of how they interpreted a whole host of different areas of, of religious freedom concerns in the context of federal law. Hiring was a big piece of that. Um, the brand memo, I, which I, rec I, I referenced a few minutes ago, that was specifically stating to all agencies that guidance is guidance and you have to make clear that it is guidance. It is not um, it is not something that has the full act of, of law the way that a regulation would. Um, and then DOJ also issued a memo in its interpretation of the Bostock decision, um, which the, the Supreme Court limited just to Title VII, and the DOJ memo reinforced that, that interpretation. That memo, um, I believe, has since been withdrawn. Um, the Department of Labor issued some guidance for religious hiring in the world of contracting. So there is an executive order, there seems to be for everything, that um, governs how, uh, what non-discrimination protections are required of federal contractors. Um, and that's something that is directly controlled by the White House and by the executive branch. But that executive order includes an exemption with language that directly mirrors Title VII. Um, that exemption was put in place by President Bush. Um, it was left in place by President Obama when he made his own changes to that executive order. But there just was not clarity as to how that exemption would be applied. Would it be applied like Title VII or would they be giving it a more narrow gloss? Um, and so the Department of Labor tried to bring some clarity to that. Um, some really common ones that you've, you're probably familiar with out of HHS, um, there were revisions to the contraceptive mandate. And of course, that's um, a carousel that's been going around and around for quite a while. Uh, the contraceptive mandate has had a lot of revisions made to it over the years. Um, but that was the requirement that employers cover uh, contraceptive um, coverage in their employment plans. Um, and of course, a lot of religious organizations had religious objections to that. Um, and the transgender mandate, which was first issued under the Obama administration and would require um, many doctors, nurses, medical professionals to perform um, transgender services and um, other types of medical care in transition, even when they did not believe it was in the best interest of their patients. Um, and then, of course, there was an HHS regulation on the enforcement of medical conscience provisions in federal law, like the Weldon, Weldon Amendment, the Coates Snow Amendment. Um, there's, there was a host of about 20, some of them, that were included in, in enforcement in that regulation. Um, and then under the Department of Education, there was a long sought after um, clarification on the definition of a controlled by organization. So under Title IX, um, religious institutions of higher education that are controlled by a religious organization have an exemption. Um, and that the, the process for that exemption and the scope of that exemption um, were should have been clear, but there was some, some specificity that was given to that Department of Education. And so that's, that's just a very brief tour of, um, of some of the things that were done. Of course, one of the challenges in the, in the world we live in where so much is done by federal agencies, um, that policy priority tree from the top down will change based on who's in the White House. So legislation is really hard to change um, depending on the makeup of Congress. Agency regs are not easy to change, but they're a lot easier in a lot of circumstances than um, getting legislation through Congress. And so you can see some um, ping ponging back and forth from one administrator sometimes on, on what uh, the interpretation is given to a lot of these uh, important protections. So with the Biden administration, they were inaugurated, obviously, um, on January 20th. So we haven't even gotten a month into this administration. And what we have to go on is, is what they've done so far. Um, they've issued 29 orders, executive orders so far um, and counting. That's pretty common um, based on the track record of uh, the last couple of administrations as well. Uh, one of the executive orders, though, that I'll highlight here that they issued on day one was directing all federal agencies agencies to take the Supreme Court's decision and according to the decision was limited to Title VII and to, to apply that to its full legal limits across all areas of federal law. So the term sex comes up in dozens and dozens of other, um, I think 
the, the count was just shy of 200 other places of a federal law. And so the, um, the executive order directed all of those agencies to look at your regs, look at the federal statutes that you're responsible for overseeing um, and apply this new definition in that context. So it was a very broad, overarching, high-level executive order. Exactly mean um, in the long run is still unclear. There was no mention of religious exemptions in the executive order, and it's still too early to know what kinds of details um, and policy changes will on the ground. But these are things that will be worked out through the regulatory process. And so watching that process is going to be really important to understanding the tangible implications of what that executive order means. A second thing that he issued on day one, which is also pretty common, um, is all regulations that were not yet implemented or finalized were frozen. And all agencies were directed to look at those regulations and consider if they, if they wanted to make any policy changes for everything that was still pending. So like I said, it's still very early in the administration. Um, and while high level pro policy priorities are starting to become clear or they were made clear on the, on the campaign trail, the, the details of what some of these policy priorities will look like is still um, to be determined. Well, Amy, I was going to jump into, we got a great question from one of our listeners, which by the way, if folks have questions, uh, email them to webinar at ecfa.org and we'll try to tackle as many of those as we can uh, towards the end of our time together. But I thought this is a good one to ask right here, which is, uh, would Amy know a website where we can read, track, uh, and observe the presidential executive orders. So uh, is that something that you all are doing at Beckett or is there is there a place where folks uh, can sort of, as you mentioned, uh, watch? <laughs> is there a place, a one-stop shop, if you will, where folks can uh, get that information? That's a great question. There are two places that you can watch that. All executive orders are published in the Federal Register. So if you either manually check it or or you have a search function set up to send you an email update, you'll catch it in that filter. But that is usually at least a day or two behind um, what's actually issued. And so the White House typically, if they sign something, if, if the president signs something during the day, the text will be available at some point before the end of the day or later in the evening on the White House website. Um, and that's typically when I'm trying to get the text quickly, mm. I'll look directly at the White House website. Good. That's a great tip. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Um, and I know there's there's a lot to slog through here, so I'll move through the next couple of, of things pretty quickly. But the projected actions, it's you know, of course, we don't have a crystal ball, um, but I can tell you what I know a lot of policy and advocacy organizations are asking the Biden administration to do. Some of the things on that list includes um, polling or revising what's known as the World Vision Memo, which was issued uh, by the Department of Justice in 2007 and, and gives the DO perspective on RIFRA's application to the world of federal grants. So I know some faith-based organizations have federal contracts. Um, a lot of faith-based organizations have federal grants. And RIFRA's application in that context is a really important thing to know how the DOJ is going to be reading that. And so it will be important to watch what the DOJ does with that guidance that's been on the books now for 14 years. Um, another thing that the administration could focus on if they want to is religious accommodations training in the military. This one is really exciting because Congress has, in, in the last National Defense Authorization Act, required the Department of Defense to create training on religious accommodations in the military. Um, and this is particularly important for minority faiths like Sikhs or Muslims who want to wear their beard and turban and serve without having to shave those important religious symbols. Um, and in most cases are able to do so, but it's been very difficult for them um, in many cases to, to get that religious accommodation. Um, and so that's an area that there could be a lot of positive progress made. Um, you know, and then the scope of Title VII and Title IX exemptions, like we've talked about, that's another one that gets debated a lot. Um, and so we, we do not know yet what the administration will do um, with a number of those important points. Um, so if, I think that's, that pretty much caps off the overview of the Biden administration. Um, and we can move on to talking about what this means for you on the ground. So I would say there are four main points of what this means for you and your ministries. Um, the first is that, that 
there is the likelihood for less clarity. I would say the the number of pieces of guidance, of clarity, of um, revised language that came out of the last administration was very, very high. Um, and so as some of these policies are reconsidered or potentially altered or rolled back, um, it might mean that we move back into a space of some open questions as to how an agency is going to apply a certain area of federal law. Um, and this could be in including things like the interpretations of religious exemptions and employment, eligibility for federal funding, I think is going to be a really big next frontier. Um, and so there will be some potential for open questions there. These proposed regulations can sometimes be unclear when you get a new piece of, 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 of um, regulations from an agency. It might not be clear from that new, new reg how it's going to apply in the context of religious organizations. And so continuing to pursue clarity with agencies in new regulatory frontiers is going to be important. Um, a second point that I think is, um, and I kind of just touched on it and referenced it in my last comment, is the potential for new regulations or legislative language. Um, so a couple of uh, pending very large important bills pending before Congress or that will be reintroduced soon are the Equality Act, which expands non-discrimination protections across seven different areas of law, including in the area of public accommodation. So it's a really massive change to current federal law but it's a bill that has no religious exemptions and dials back the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which we um, discussed earlier, and the Do No Harm Act, which would just amend RIFRA. Both of those are things that are pending before Congress um, that would have a huge impact on religious organizations if they're passed. And the Biden administration has said that the Equality Act is, is a priority for them. So we know that that's a discussion that will be on the table. Um, there are other like, re potential revisions to regulatory protections for conscience protections, like we discussed in the arena of HHS um, and grants and contracts, which I think we've mentioned already. I think third in what is it increases the importance of your voice. Are you prepared to communicate the impact of your ministry and your needs and how certain policy proposals will, will impact you and your effectiveness. Um, and I don't mean become policy experts on everything. I mean, um, for example, when you work for a member of Congress, it's your job to know who the, the important um, faith-based organizations, employers, um, all sorts of different issue areas in your district to know who they are. Um, and so are you prepared to have those conversations, explain what you do and what that impact is in your community? You can't assume that just because you're in a ministry that members of Congress or their staff or agency staff are going to inherently understand what you do and how it's valued to the people that you are ministering to. It's not inherently obvious. There's been a lot of work done um, trying to put a dollar value on the impact of religion in American society. And the best study out there right now, study done by Brian Grimm, um, and in the, he measured the social, socioeconomic impact of real America. So they estimated out of 344,000 um, communities, congregations across the country, that the combined annual value of these organizations and what they add to their communities is two. $243.9 million. That is more than Google, Apple, and Amazon combined. Huge dollar amount of organizations that are doing things like food pantries, ministering to the homeless, helping people who maybe don't have a shelter over their heads, um, dealing with issues like domestic violence or um, immigration and helping people get settled when when they're completely new here and have no no pre-existing connections. There's very tangible evidence of the impact of faith-based organizations, but you just can't assume that that's going to translate without you helping to connect the dots a little bit. So your voice and your ability to tell your story is going to matter. Um, and then you're right, for lawyers, litigation doesn't really sound all that intimidating, but I know from talking to our amazing clients, um, who step up to the plate and are willing to go to bat for hashing out their rights in the legal arena. There are times where conversation runs out and you, you need to ask a court to settle a dispute over how to interpret a certain area of law. How does RIFRA apply? What does Title VII mean? What is the constitutional doctrine that, that um, comes into play here? Um, and sometimes 
there is a need to defend your organizational rights and, and your ability to minister consistent with your faith um, in, that, in that arena. And I think my favorite part of working with Beckett is the amazing clients that we, we get to see day in and day out. I had the privilege of sitting with Sharon L. Fulton, um, one of our foster moms in our a litigation at the Supreme Court right now, um, during oral argument. And they were, what a hero this woman is, the number of children that she has affected and saved by bringing them into her home and sharing what she has and loving them well. Um, and every client has it like that. Um, you know, but there is sometimes that need to, to, to ask a court to, to step in and, 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 and protect your rights. Say you have a lot to share as an organization. Um, and it's good to communicate that and build relationships before there is a conflict arising. Um, I would just add one last disclaimer here, and I'm not telling you to go lobby or not go lobby. Not all communications to the Hill or to the White House or to agencies are, are lobbying. There are a lot of exemptions to lobbying definitions. Um, it's certainly something to be aware of. Um, but for example, submitting a comment through the NPRM process is not considered lobbying. That's an exemption. Um, and so there are a lot of ways that you can communicate what you do um, and what your concerns are without getting into um, maybe some uh, less, less familiar to you. Um, Michael, with that, I had one slide that kind of gave an overview of EO 12866 meetings, which are um, basically the last stop on a line of an agency getting OIRA approval to finalize a reg. Um, and so this is probably a more obscure tool, um, but it's a tool that is a matter of public record. And so I put up there um, just a, a series of screenshots where you can see, I just picked the top reg on the OIRA dashboard. So when a, a reg has been finalized, it goes to OIRA and then they review it and approve it before it can be published in the Federal Register. While it's pending at OIRA, which can be a couple of weeks or a couple of months, they take meetings. Um, and so you can see who else has met with OIRA. Um, you can request a meeting um, with OIRA if you so choose. Um, but that's just a slightly more obscure tool that I don't think people are, are super aware of. Um, and then with the white, uh, I wanted to take a brief moment to note a report from the White House faith-based um, Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. And this is something you are probably familiar with. It was started under President Bush. Every president since him has had their own iteration or version of the office. But in 2010, um, there was a report that was put out by a commission to President Obama um, about faith-based partnerships and their importance, the role that they play in the federal government. And this quote is just so wonderful because the report recognizes time and again the important role that faith-based organizations have to play in community and social service providers, um, that these are important partners, um, partners who know the communities that they serve, they, they know the people on the ground, they're efficient, they're effective in what they do, and we need more of these partnerships. If we need more of these partnerships, we also need clarity um, on, on what the religious latitude is going to be in a lot of these areas that we discussed. Um, and so this is an important balance where I think there's a lot of room for conversation um, and a, a lot of room for people to understand the important impact that faith-based organizations have um, moving forward. And so that's just a really helpful, helpful tidbit to keep in mind. Um, I could talk for hours about all of the litigation that we have going on. Um, I will just uh, close with this. The last 10 years of Supreme Court precedent um, has been really encouraging, by and large, for religious liberty. A lot of very strong decisions, and not marginal ones, like unanimous decisions, seven to two decisions, really strong statements from the Supreme Court on the importance that religious liberty plays in our Constitution and in our society. Um, what those holdings mean when they play out on the ground is really something that is determined in the lower courts. And so we have ongoing litigation, of course, in a lot of these areas that we talked about. This is just a sampling of our cases um, that we have going right now. But Title VII um, and the ministerial exception, I think, is a really big one. Um, we're representing a couple of different schools in that arena in some of the circuit courts as we speak. 
uh, the area of COVID regulations. And you probably saw the Supreme Court had an important decision just a few days ago on uh, limitation caps for houses of worship and how those are determined. Um, so there's a lot of really ripe opportunities here, things that will be continuing to develop the uh, application of religious liberty law going forward. A lot of the story is, is left to be written. Good. Well, Amy, that's a great place uh, to sort of land it here uh, in terms of the main presentation. We have a couple more important announcements, but just want to say thank you again uh, for that. That's some great insight, some great coaching for us. And a couple of important announcements here as we close out our time together. We are excited here at ECFA to announce our next free webinar on Thursday, March 4th, regarding five predictions about charitable giving in 2021. Uh, Dr. Warren Bird will be joining me for that webinar. You can visit the link on your screen or email research at ecfa.org to share your insights with us before the survey closes here in just a few days. So uh, we appreciate everyone investing time in that. Uh, and then also, as we know, we are right in the middle of tax season here, and ECFA is here to help with our 2021 Church and Nonprofit Tax and Financial Guide and the Minister's Tax and Financial Guide. Um, in addition to the free PDF downloads of individual chapters or the entire guides. You'll also find over a dozen bonus short videos on our website that highlight some of the key takeaways. You can visit the link on your screen to download and view these free resources. And then finally, while I have this opportunity, I also want to say a very sincere thank you to many of our over 2,500 ECFA members who are represented on today's webinar. And for other friends who are also with us today, now is a great time to take that next step in becoming ECFA accredited. Uh, we know that in these days where there's so much uncertainty, that givers are looking for ministries of the highest integrity that they can trust to steward their resources and see the kingdom advance. And so during this COVID season, ECFA is waiving the standard initial $500 application fee for membership. And you can learn more about this opportunity by emailing me directly at president at ecfa.org. I look forward to sharing more and getting to know your organization. Well, that brings us to the end of today's ECFA webinar on what the presidential transition means for religious ministries. We hope this has been meaningful and helpful to you. You'll be receiving another email tomorrow with the link to the recording and other related materials. And again, we'd really like to thank Amy Vitale for her great presentation and insights and for each person who joined us today for this webinar. May God bless you as you continue to shine bright the light of Jesus Christ in these times.